What do I do? I'm an Indian art specialist. I do collect, but I collect only a very moderate scale for myself because I am a dealer and I think a dealer has an obligation to offer most material. But I have great relationships and they're terribly important to me. I can't imagine not being involved with many of the artists that I've gotten to know very, very well. I think I'm pretty much born to be an artist. Now and then I've run into dealers or employees that are very like fast talking and you know or uh, condescending to me or disrespectful in some way or you know and I just go I wouldn't trust this person to represent my work to to customers. It, you have I mean the whole thing I talk about dealers there are all kinds of dealers good bad and indifferent. I take a look at how how the dealer presents themselves you know their their gallery space or space how I interact with them just on a very casual, casual level, how they treat me, um, mostly my gut. When I first met Dexter, she was already, she's a potter. She's a Tewa Hopi potter. I asked Dexter once, how long after you started making pottery before you were good? She said, I was always good. And she was, but I wanted to get pots from her and she, very sweetly said, well, sign, put your name on my list. Now that list didn't mean anything. That was her way of just being polite and getting rid of me. But I kept going back and I kept talking to her and she finally decided to let me have her pots. Marty's one of the most respected and liked dealers, especially by living artists. She knows her role in this, you know, she's a professional. She dresses really well. She knows how to present artwork. She's someone who uh, we are, we're really happy to be associated with, and she has really, really great taste. So when she wants to carry your work, it's really a tremendous compliment. If I'm looking at my role as a dealer, uh, I know that one of the things I have certain obligations to deal as fairly as I can I have to make a profit, I'm in business, but I have to deal as fairly as I can so that it's a fair deal for me, it's a fair deal for the client, it's a fair deal for the artist who sold the material. And I fell in with a dealer named, um, I won't mention his name, <laughs> but uh, he actually bought me lots of tools and got me started, but I was so young and very naive and inexperienced and very kind of shy and uh, not very confident yet that he realized this is an opportunity to take advantage of somebody. I got a lot out of it, but it was it was very highly exploitive in in many ways. I got to the point where my skill was good enough, and I was make I was making things that were my own work. There was a major, very wealthy man from Chicago who opened a gallery in Scottsdale, and he wanted Dexter's pottery. And he called Dexter on it and he said, I'm going to fly up and I want to exclusively carry your pottery. Dexter told me this. She said, I said to him, you don't know anything about Hopis. You don't care about us Hopis. All you care about is getting our pottery and making money and I won't sell to you. One of the things that was very poignant for me was, was one elder uh, who on the stand kind of explained it. It was the first time I'd actually heard it explains so, so well. That was that in the Yurok world, a person's regalia is in part a mark of that person standing in the community. So the person's items are part of the person's identity. These various Pueblo cultures and Navajo culture are extremely complex. I've done a lot of reading, a lot of studying, I've taken some classes. And I know some things, and I know a fair amount at Hopi, but there's a ton I don't know and I'm not supposed to know. But I have to just say Dexter's Pottery, she's doing designs that are all traditional and meaningful to her. 
Now, I've done a great deal of research on her uh, great-grandmother, and that was the great potter Nampeo, and I'm considered one of the one of the authorities on recognizing Nampeo's work. But there's a lot of meaning to the symbolism of the painting uh, paintings, the images, and I need to understand those. To under I need to understand something about the Hopi culture to know what she's doing. The act it's Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and uh, most of the attention and focus. Uh, both in the media and in negotiations, have been on the repatriation side of things. I think a lot of collectors and dealers that do deal in what we'd say culturally sensitive material really know better. With, with the act coming in, it now gave the tribes a, a legal authority and backing to do that. So you know, generally, uh, I think NAG, NAGPRA's, uh, you know was, was a good thing because it simply it, it, um, it, it moved along something that needed to be moved along. I think for the most part it's a really good thing. There's definitely instances when maybe it's abused or or someone really doesn't know what they have is, is something that should be repatriated. But I, well, from what I've heard for the most part it, it, it goes pretty smoothly. My first review committee or review board uh, meetings in the, um, seemed like it was in the early 90s and the thing that struck me, I think this was in Santa Fe, they all came into the room, the review board, you know, scientists, Native Americans, museum people, uh, archaeologists, museum curators, they all came in to sit down and start to deliberate on some rather sticky issues, and they all had a, a vial of Tylenol that they put out on the, on the table before they started, you know, and, and they all knew they would have a massive headache by the end of the day, you know, and, and, and it just... That was how they opened their meeting, and it just got worse from there. I think the other problem with these objects, not only are they considered from multiple perspectives as both religious objects, art objects, but then there's a whole scientific community who treats this as scientific data for the advancement of a science and a particular worldview that may not be uh, even closely re uh, or remotely aligned with the Native American viewpoint. So you have this one object that's got religious uh, stigma attached to it, artistic stigma attached to it, uh, scientific values attached to it, uh, and then the law treats it as a private property right. For example, scientific value is objective, being removed from the object, being uh, you know, removed from the subject, um, and, and being very objective and fact-driven. And so when a Native American comes to advocate and is very emotional because they're bringing their own worldviews which has got to do with their ancestors and, and their respect and their responsibilities towards their ancestors, um, that emotion has nothing to do, is almost disclaimed because it does not fit in with the worldview of a scientist. So you're at a level of, of disagreement already before you even get into the issues. You're at a level of disagreement because one is coming from a different uh, part of, of behavior than another one. One is rational thought and one is emotional, you know, um, um, you know tears and grief and, and, and that type and blame and, and anger. And so before you even get into the issues of what is this object, you've already set up to fail because of the worldviews that are, are diametrically opposed. Well, the government can't provide enough. In fact, that's one of the scary things, that they just become dependent on the government and rely on Social Security. Generally the speaking, their, their, their level of income is very low. Their health service is not very good, and they need any help they can get. I mean, many, many of the Native Americans in the Southwest are unemployed. They're only, I mean, Zuni, virtually every household has a jeweler in it. Every household. They're there to sell jewelry and make money. That's how they live. And those are the people I meet. Because it's our culture. It's, uh, we express ourselves through our jewelry, and you have to survive. It's a business, and you have to look at it as a business, just like everything else. I think for the most part, it's, it's, a, it's a preservation and sort of celebration of the material culture. Well, I think it's definitely preserving the culture, especially if we look at now. I mean, all these Indians are surviving that, that's their cash economy. They, the only way they have of earning money, unless a few of them work out of their pueblos or villages, most of them can't afford to because they have to be there for ceremonial lives. So 
of the contemporary uh, artists I work with, I don't know a one that doesn't need the money. It's about survival. It's a practical thing. It, this is my livelihood. It's about putting a roof over your head.